Okay, I, a couple announcements. One is that uh, I will not be here uh, Wednesday or Friday. However, there will be class Wednesday. Um, there will be class. That'll be done by Andreas, who does the 111X. So he's going to come in here. And he asks, uh, so two things. One is he doesn't have the, the cool Apple technology like I do, so he won't be screen recording the lecture. So if you aren't here on Wednesday or Friday, then you are going to miss the lecture. There will not be, I haven't talked to him about the secret word. I don't know if I'll give him a secret word. Um, anyway, you won't be able to re-watch it unless you surreptitiously kind of whoop out the iPhone and do the hip shot of him up here. Uh, so you'll definitely want to show up since you won't have that flexibility for those two lectures. Also, he wants to do some in-class kind of collaborative group stuff as he works through some problems. He wants you all to try out some things as well. So he asks if you all could bring in your laptops. Uh, if you happen to be the lone student without a laptop, that's fine. He's actually going to ask you to, to group into pairs or triples. So as long as at least a third of you bring in a laptop you should be all right. Uh, if you want to be the cool person leading a group rather than being a follower looking over a shoulder, then bring your laptop. There will be, uh, there will be the labs as well. The lab on, so I will have the next assignment posted. I will be here Wednesday morning, so I will be here for the Wednesday morning lab. The Wednesday, Thursday labs will just be to support your work on assignment five. So assignment four is coming due in, I don't know, like 30, 24, 36 hours, if I recall correctly. Uh, so the next assignment will be popping up in, in the same period of time. I'd like to get it up tonight. We'll see. Anyway, the lab will just be to support your work in that. So if you've got the assignment finished, early or whatever, then really there's no need to show up to the lab. Okay. So I think that does it for the announcements. Do you have any questions for me on any topic whatsoever? Are you starting to feel like lean, mean, C++ machines? No, all right. <laughs> all right, just get back on that surfboard. You'll be riding those Mavericks soon enough. <clears throat> okay, no questions? All right, all right. Uh, I guess I should finish typing this out. There will be class not recorded, but bring laptops. I'll also get a, an announcement sent out like Tuesday evening to remind you to bring your laptops. So what I want to, there are a couple things I want to talk about today. One is I want to talk about a couple keywords called break and continue. And then I want to talk about the C language and where there's some differences. Getting going downstream a little bit, we'll see some additional differences from the language. Uh, but we'll see what differences we have to date with the C language here in the second half. So again, the keywords that I'm interested in are break and continue continue. And these are words that you use in loops. So let's create a loop. Integer i equals 0. i is less than 10. i plus plus. And what I'll do is I'll just print out i equals. And we'll just print out what i is equal to. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna mix it up too. I've been using this using namespace standard all semester. I'm gonna leave that out today, so we can see where I'm actually using where that's being used. Now before I keep going. I always want to check that what I've got is working so far. All right, no big mystery there. All right. If i equals 5 or i equals 6, continue. So, whoops, that's not even a keyword. What am I doing there? Wrong language. All right. So, let's see what effect that has on our code. And I compile it. I run it. And we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are missing. Okay, 7, 8, 9. So, what continue does is that means if it hits this word then it's immediately going to go to the end of the loop and the reason I say immediately go to the end of the loop is because it's at the end of the loop that this occurs right that third part of a for loop always occurs at the end of the loop so what it's doing is it's avoiding doing line 12 and it isn't just simply lest you think that I'm just skipping over one line. You could, you could have a, a thousand lines here, or a hundred, and once it hits a continue, it immediately goes to the bottom of the loop. For the for loop, it's going to redo the I++. Then it goes to the top of the loop, and at the top of the loop, it asks this question. That one always occurs at the top of the loop, and so that's why we're getting five and six skipped. Any questions on that? All right. Pretty straightforward, I think. If you only want to skip over a certain amount, of lines. If you only want to skip over a certain amount, like, uh, for example. Yeah, you just got a whole bunch of lines of code there doing. Like oh, you mean you mean line I line see. So you're saying that I want to skip over line fifty line. of the hundred lines? Yeah, you don't, you don't want uh, to Then I line. would uh, find a different way of doing the logic. <coughs> Yeah, so you can do, you can do, um, right, you, well, so I have 50 lines, I have 50 lines, and if I just want to skip over the first 50, then I, I would, I would instead of, I would not use a continue any longer, let me leave those there. What I would do instead is I would say, um, if it does not equal 5 and it does not equal 6, then I will do those 50 lines. Otherwise, I'm going to skip those 50 lines and do the following. So it, 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 I would just choose a different set of logic in that case. Uh, also, as a little side note, one of the things as you write code and you get these nested loops and you get the if statements and so forth, your code starts to look messy. So here, I mean, I've got several lines butted up against the left column and I want to get everything indented nicely. Uh, there's actually, Vim will do that for you. Vim to, what do I want to say? Um, Re-indent code use equal, I'm not quite sure how to write this direct direction or movement. So what I mean by that, in the silly case, uh, a mo so j is a movement, right? So I could say equal j, which I just did, there wasn't anything to see, and it would re-indent these two lines. For you to be able to see it, let me do this. So if I say equal j, that would be lines 5 and 6 that it re-indented. To correct indentation. Uh, so really the movement as a J isn't that useful. What would be useful is if my movement magically took me the entire breadth of the file. So if I'm at the beginning of the file, an uppercase G takes me to the bottom of the file. 
right? So one way of doing this very effectively is to get to the very top of the file, say equal in an uppercase G, that movement takes me all the way to the bottom of the file, and that in effect has uh, you re-indenting the entire file. So equal G means re-indent from current position to end of file. Now the next question is, can you easily get to the very beginning of the file? And you can get to the very beginning of the file. Uh, there are a couple ways of doing it. An easy way is to say gg jump to the beginning of the file. So a recipe then you can do is say gg equal g, and that is reindent the entire file. Okay. So as you're coding away and things get a little messy, just go gg equal g, note the uppercase g is the last one, and you will, you'll get this little informative message down here, and you'll have your code nicely indented once again. It also helps you find errors, right? So we talked about how the if statement only works on a, the line following, so I say if... Um, if I say if j is less than 5, then what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to say c out pi, and then on a different line I want to say c out there. But I only want to do that if j is less than 5. But we know that this if statement is only going to work on one statement if I don't have it in a block. Uh, so visually we can easily miss that, but if I have it do the magic re-indenting, gg equal g, then I will notice that it's cleverly indented that because it's part of the if, and it knows that this isn't part of the if, so it puts it here. So now that's giving you a visual cue that things aren't working as you might expect it. So it can help you in that respect as well. All right, enough of that little jaunt down the alleyway. <clears throat> uh, a close cousin to... I guess I'm going to comment out... Comment out that stuff. There, so that's what I originally had. Let me make sure I've been doing a lot of typing in here, make sure I have the original behavior. And we're missing 5 and 6, so that's what we had before. I'm going to create a separate loop here. I'll say for integer j equals... And we'll do the same thing. 0, j is less than 10, j plus plus. And j is equal to the exact same kind of thing. And I can't forget my STDs. Uh, all right. And no pun intended. If, um, so what I want to do is if j is greater than, whoops, if j is greater than 4, what I want to do is break. Now let me put another line here, std standard c out, there we go, I don't want to forget my standards. Um, after the loops. So if j is greater than 4, then we want to break. So let's see what that does. Compile, we run it. Here's my j's. So once j is greater than 4, what break means is exactly what is implied, which is the loop is abandoned at that point. So as soon as it sees a break, it immediately jumps to a line, take your pick, 29 or 30. Okay, after the loop. All right. Any questions before I shift gears? Okay. Uh, let me ask another miscellaneous unrelated question. In fact, I'll do it with um, 
going to do with a different set of code. So if I You all may have noticed on assignment four, I had double quotes there for hexagon.h. Uh, anyone want to hazard a guess whether that'll work for IO stream? We'll try it. And it does work. It compiles just fine. Oops. So the question is, what is the difference between these two lines? And let me first describe this. I know I talked about this at one point, but it's worth uh, re-examining. In there, again, this is means to find the file called iostream and put a copy of that file right here in line two. And iostream's huge. It's like 10,000 lines. So there are literally 10,000 lines of code shoved right there that the compiler compiles. What the, the angle braces mean is look down a predefined set of paths for that file. And it varies from system to system. On Linux and Unix systems, it tends to be fairly standard locations. They're going to be, depending on the system, anywhere between 4 and 12 standard locations that it'll look. 4, 4 to 12 directories. And it'll say, is iostream in this directory? No, is it in this directory? And it'll just go through that whole list. Until it, so if I make this a file that doesn't exist, what will happen is it will go through all four to ten standard locations, and when it doesn't find it, it'll say that it couldn't find the file. Okay. The only difference between the angle braces and the quotes is the quotes means before I look down those standard sets of directories, first look in your current directory. That's the only thing it means, the, the only difference between the two. So when I put IO stream in double quotes, that was simply saying look for the file called IO stream in your current directory. If it's not there, then look down your standard set of directories. And that's exactly what it did. So the reason why in assignment four I have hexagon.h is because hexagon.h doesn't exist in one of those predefined standard directories. The only, it, so it has to be in your current directory, and that's why I'm doing that. Okay. So let's talk about C code for a little bit. <clears throat> right now, right now I think pretty much everything that we're doing in C++ works in C as well. I don't see any differences except for one area, and that is an input and an output. Uh, when you create your files by convention, you suffix your file with a C, not with a CPP. And in fact, I can copy all this code. So far, this is the same. The next is, since input and output is different, this IO stream is something that doesn't exist in the C language. It is standard io.h. This, this is something else that you'll see that is different between C and C++. And this is mostly a historical difference. Is There are all sorts of standard header files that you include in both languages. In the C language, they tend to have a .h on the end. And C++ basically dispense with the .h, and they just name their files without that .h. Uh, so in the C language, this means standard io.h. There is no such thing as a namespace in the C language, so you get rid of that. In fact, let's look at the error. Uh, also, finally, when you compile your code, it's GCC, not G++. And you'll see that it's throwing all sorts of errors because it has no idea what using namespace standard means. Okay? Otherwise, it, it gives that 
terse and useless kind of error that you've come to know and love from C++. So we get rid of that. Now, what do you do to print out things in the C language? Print F. We have some C coders here. There is, no, there is no C out, there is no end line. That means if you want a new line, you have to use that specific character. Uh, we haven't talked about functions, and in fact, uh, Andreas, when he's here on Wednesday and Friday, is going to talk about functions a fair amount. But one thing you can note based on the little that we've looked at with functions is that printf is just a function. And what you do is you provide, in double quotes, something that you want to print out. We can compile that. We can run it. And it will, by the way, it'll produce, everything on the compiler is the same otherwise. So if I don't give it a name, it assumes a dot out. I'm welcome to give it a dash o option and uh, have it create an executable of, the, of what I specified after the dash o option. So the, the whole compile line is the same with the exception that suffix your files with .c and use GCC, not G++. So now where it, this is where it really starts to get weird when you compare it to C++ in printing things out. And that is how do you print out <coughs> things. So I'm going to create an integer x equals to 32. I'm going to create a float fl equal to 3.14. And the way I print it out is really, really wacky. So this thing in double quotes here is what's called the um, formatting string. It describes the format of what you're going to print out. Now it just so happens that this format is literally what I've typed in. It it gets a little more esoteric when you want to print out variables. And they have what are called per percent codes. So a percent i means I want an integer here. A percent, any guesses for float? Yes, means I want a float here. <clears throat> Yes, and we'll look at that. All right. There we go. So if I want a if I want an integer between the two L's and L hello, all I do is I say percent I. So that looks really weird. That's what that means. You'll even note, I don't know if you can tell it on the projector or not that the percent %i they've syntactically put in a slightly different color. It's more that kind of pinkish color. And then what I do is here is a comma separated list of the <coughs> things I want to print out. So what I want to print out where that percent %i is is I want to print out my integer <coughs> x that I created on line 5. So that's what I'll do. I'll put that X there. We can go ahead and compile that and run it just to see. All right, and there it put the 32 between the two L's. Uh, we can stick the float in there. Let's put it between the W and the, well, how about between the R and the L? Just like that. And then I have to add my floating point number to this comma separated list afterward. The order of these variables here, x and fl, has to match the order of their appearance in the string. So the integer appears first, so I need the x to be first. The float appears second, so I need the fl second. Okay. I compile it. And there we get uh, the float between the R and the L. Now floating point numbers, it's, you can see it's defaulting to six spaces of precision. You can change that precision 
by saying, I'm going to borrow this. Oops. Okay, so I have both a period and a two, so point two f should mean that I get uh, three point one four, and I run it. Whoops, I'm running the wrong one. Let me get rid of that. FDSA. Oop, dip, 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 dip. What am I doing wrong here? Uh, it is. Oh, that's because I did it in the comment. I didn't do it down here. Point two. Okay, so there I have 3.14. I can even bring it down to one, one place of precision. So 3.1. And it, it will round off. So if I say this is 3.17, if I do it to just one decimal place of precision, it should be 3.2, yes? And there we go. Uh, let's try printing out, um, let's try printing out numbers by 10 and using this printf. So I'm going to create i equals 0, i is less than 10, plus plus i, and what I want to do is I want to printf percent i, yeah, let me choose, let me, I'm going to give this a name, I'm going to call this index. And what I'm going to print out, new line, I'm going to print out uh, index times 10. So the first time, 0 times 10 is 0, so it should print out 0, then 10, then 20, then 30, all the way up to 90. Uh, let me make this 11. Let's print it all less than 11, so it'll go up to 10 times 10, which is 100. Let's compile that, let's run it, and there we have it. Okay. But what I want to do is I want all of these numbers to line up the way you would on a spreadsheet, where the ones are lined up and the tens and the hundreds are all lined up. So how many spaces do I need? I, if I have three digit numbers, then I need all these to print in three spaces. So let's try changing this i to percent three i. Let's try a little more. Yes, go ahead. About the, uh, the top, the, uh, the int main. When I was learning C, we always put void in parentheses. What's the difference? By putting void here? Yes. There's very little difference. So it main main's always a weird creature, so I'm loath to put it in the context of main, but let me just talk about functions generally. So I'm going to create a function. It's a nonsense function. Float nonsense. And all this function is going to do is it's going to return 9.99. Okay, little one-liner. I guess let me, so down here at the bottom I'll even call the nonsense function. Nonsense. GCC. Oops. And it runs fine. We don't see any difference because I'm not doing anything with the nonsense function. So first, first uh, um, I'll get to it, but let's go over what's happening. I am creating a function that is going to, when it's done doing its thing, and this is it doing its thing, okay? This is one line, it's simple, it's stupid. This could easily be 1,000 lines of doing its thing. All right. When it's done doing its thing, it is going to give me back a floating point number. That is what this means. So if you look at where I actually call this function, I'm not doing anything with what nonsense is giving me back. 
and that's fine. You're under no obligation to do anything with what nonsense gives back to you. Could you if you wanted to? Oh yeah, absolutely. Let me create a float called um, Bobby Teenager and we will say that Bobby Teenager is equal to whatever nonsense returns. Yeah, let's do, let's do, let's print it out. Printf, Bobby says, and then I put a little percent %f there, a new line, and I'm going to print out Bobby Teenager. Okay, let's compile it, run it, and Bobby says 9.99. Note that, again, it defaults to the six digits of precision unless I change that in the printf. Uh, so yeah, so a function can return something, and you're and as I showed the first time I ran it, even though it returns something, you're under no obligation to do anything with what is returned. However, you're welcome to. In fact, what you all didn't know is printf is a normal everyday function, and printf actually returns something. I talked briefly about man pages at one point. Uh, let's see, it's very complicated and I don't want to get into what it's showing us here, but you'll note here's the function name and this is what it's returning. So printf actually is returning an integer to us, we're just not doing anything with it. If you're curious as to, well, why would printf return anything, what it actually returns is the number of things it actually printed out. So it, I, it should be two here that it would give back to us. It might be information that you use for something or other. It's either that or the number of characters, I guess. Let's let's figure that out. Returns, return. Yeah, the oh, the number of characters printed. All right. So, however many characters are in "Hello World" in the new line here is what would be returned from this printf. Um, that's the deal with this. If I don't want, if I have a function that isn't returning anything, and I don't want it to return anything, then I would put the word void here. And that just simply says, I am not returning anything from the function. In fact, once I say this, this line here will not compile. So I should get an error on line 11, uh, because I'm trying to return something when I said void. So let's see if this thing vomits on us when we get to line 11. Yeah, so here's line 11. No, oh, I'm creating nonsense more than once, so it's complaining about that. Uh, so it's saying avoid function nonsense should not return a value, and here I'm trying to return 9.99. So it does give you an error if you specify the function returns nothing and you try to return something. This is nonsense too. So you can, you're, perf you're perfectly fine having a return statement in a void in a, I would call it a void function, a function that returns void. But when you use that return, you just can't specify anything after the end in return. I just have it capped off with a semicolon. And that should quiet my little compiler snowflakes heart here. The next thing comes the stuff in parentheses. And the stuff in parentheses is what are the inputs to this function, the parameters to the function, the arguments. You're going to hear inputs, parameters, arguments as three words to describe what's going in here. And at some point in the past, I had done something like this. I said int sum integer 1, integer 2, and then I would have said... You know, if I really want to draw this out, the total, the total equals one plus two. Return the total. All right. So this function is adding one and two together and returning it back. So these are the inputs. How do I use it? I come down here and I can say I can call the function and I can give it a three and a five, or I can give it variables like whatever variables I created up here. I created an integer x, so I could make one of these x, x if I wanted to. So either variables or constants in there. It's doing its thing. It's giving us a, a number back. I'm under no obligation to use it. You may say, Todd, isn't that a useless function if you don't do something with the sum that's returned? Yes, you're absolutely right, but I'm talking in terms of the compiler, right? The compiler doesn't give a shit. 
to be blunt about it. You just put it in. If you want to use what's returned, that's fine. If you don't want to use what's returned, that's fine as well. The compiler doesn't care. You're under no obligation to as far as the compiler is concerned. All right. Now, to get to finally to answer the question, these two functions that I wrote, I did not provide any information to it. And that is shown in my use of it. Here I'm calling the function and I'm not providing any information in the parentheses. So if you leave empty parentheses, that means you're not passing anything in. It just so happens that that means exactly the same thing. So the moral to the story is if you're not passing in any arguments, say void, but oh, by the way, for the function parameters, void is optional. You don't have to put that in there. Any other easy questions? <laughs> OK. So where does that leave me? Yeah, we're at Bobby Teenager. We're looking at this stuff. Uh, there is another, what you're going to see, a real, really weird, interesting quirk with these percent codes. In fact, if I go man printf, or you look online, let's look online. Let's not look at the man page. Um, let's go here. Let's say c printf. See what comes up. These are called, it looks like they're calling them format specifiers here. There are some of them. Um, we have the, and then the stuff we already know, the new line, the tab, the backspace. Uh, I've got more codes. Let's see, is this tutorial any good for my needs? All right, I'm not impressed. Let's go to the reference. So now I, I, you ask me, how many percent codes are there? And then I throw my hands wide and say, look at them all. Okay, there are all sorts of percent codes. Note that uh, I, I told you that I was for integer, which it makes complete intuitive sense. <coughs> D means exactly the same thing. And there's no rhyme or reason for it, and I can't even explain it. But when I learned, I learned C before I learned C++, and I learned it as percent %D. And so I'm always writing it as percent %D, and people are scratching their heads asking what percent %D is. I don't know. It's a generational thing. I found that if you learned C in the 80s or 90s, you use percent %D. If you learned it in 2000 or beyond, you use percent %I. I don't know. Okay, you young kids. Mike used D as well. Did he? Yeah. No, he's cool then. Um, and what that, what, why the D, it means the full term, when I say int i, well, excuse me, this is a formatting for output. It means that you want to print out a decimal integer. And, what, and so your question is, well, what do I mean by decimal? That means there's also hexadecimal integers. There's octal integers. There are binary integers. Right. Uh, there are there, there's no percent code for binary integer, but as far as printf is concerned, you can print out an integer in octal or hexadecimal, and that's just a conversion. So I can print out the number. In fact, why don't we do it? If I could come to my web page and take a look, here we have um, hexadecimal is percent x. Octal, octal is, I know there's a way of printing octal. Oh, yeah, go figure. All right, so I can, let's look at the number 65. We'll make it the very first print so that we can see it. I'm going to, let's, let me make x 65. And I want to print it out as I. I want to, let me see. Let's say percent percent I. Percent D. 
percent O percent X. Um, so I've got four percent codes, so I need four numbers. I want to print out the exact same number four times. So I want to print out x, 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 okay, which is 65. So let's see what that looks like. Um, oh, I left my little notes. I was typing here. All right, there it compiled. Um, Wait a minute, what did I compile? Oh, yes, A dot app. So there it is. So our number is 65. We see that percent I and percent D print. What it means is the decimal means printed out in 10 base, the, the numbering system you learn in grade school. So it's, whether you do percent I or percent D, it's 65. This is the exact same number, but this is if you only had eight digits available to you, and this would be the number if you had 16 digits available to you. Okay, but they're all 65. All right. So it, it is just simply a, a conversion. Uh, so that is the basics of doing output is printf. Um, and I, the next assignment is not a C-based assignment, but there's going to be one or two assignments where you have to write your code in C rather than C++, so this will be useful for you to refer to in the future. I'll take the last five minutes just in case people are fuzzy on hexadecimal and octal and all that. Um, just to explain exactly what's happening. So if I start counting, what is happening after I reach line, reach number nine? So I, I've got my fingers up and I'm going zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And now I need to represent 10. But the problem is, I'm going to call these glyphs. I've run out of glyphs to use. I can invent a glyph. I'm going to call x10, and I'm going to call w11, and I'm going to call q12, right? I could do that, but I don't. I only have 10 glyphs. So what you have to do is you have to start recycling the glyphs. And now I need another space, so I have to say I'm going to utilize another space, and then I start all over again. So now I should do that. So like a speedometer, right? Once I run out of glyphs, then I go ahead and that one rolls back to zero, and this one turns up to one, just like a speedometer. And that is all octal is. So all octal is is where you have eight glyphs to use, zero through seven. So I go zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, what we all want to do with every fiber in our being is do that. But in the octal system, there is no eight glyph. There are only zero through seven. So I have to do the exact same recycling. This one goes up to the next one. That one rewinds to zero. So if you think about it as a speedometer, that's all number conversion is. What about hexadecimal? Hex stands for six. There are 16 digits. Zero, zero, one, two, three, four, uh, four, or, come on, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. The zero is the sixteenth digit, right? And then at that point, your your speedometer recycles to get another digit in there. Magic word. Magic word. To finish, the magic word is there it is. 
sinecure. No. Yes. Yes. I was thinking that was the last time. Or, yep. Sinecure. Uh, I do not have the word, the secret word quiz up yet. I'm going to walk to my office this very moment and do it. So if you give me three minutes, the secret word quiz for today will be up. <coughs> Sinecure. All right. So remember, bring your laptops for uh, Andreas on Wednesday. <laughs>